Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here and you enjoy what you are hearing, please show that subscribe button some love and don't forget to set the notification bell to all. That way you get reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. If you would like to become a member of Back to Ashes or buy me a coffee as a special thank you, that information can be found in the description box. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Stalker Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I worked in a mental hospital. A violent patient developed an obsession with me. He eventually ended up in a hospital for the criminally insane. Sometime later, he managed to convince the board that he was no longer a threat and was released. Within 72 hours of his release, he had managed to locate my home address and my home number. Hey, I said he was insane, not stupid. I began seeing him everywhere I went and getting hang up, heavy breathing type of calls. I started seeing him around my condo complex, but could never get the police there fast enough to catch him. I quit my job and moved out of state, leaving everything I owned that didn't fit in my car. It was a good two to three years before I could stop looking over my shoulder. Perhaps this is the most bizarre experience I had with a stalker right here on Quora. A few people who know me already know about how I found a keylogger one night. It was late one evening when I decided to hop on Quora and answer a request. I was in the middle of typing the draft to my answer when I noticed something peculiar out of the corner of my eye on my Android. I saw a flash of light in the upper left-hand corner of my screen. I had seen it previously, but continued to dismiss it. Then, I suddenly remember that this could be the telltale sign that someone's keylogging you. Keylogging basically means every keystroke that you make is being copied and seen by a hacker over his computer. It's fairly easy to accomplish with the right app. However, I was reluctant to believe that this was the case, but as a precaution, I decided to use a little criminal psychology 101. I didn't exit my screen. I hit enter several times and went down to the middle of the draft. I wrote this exact sentence as I have here. I know you're keylogging me. I've known it for a while now. Waited 30 seconds and immediately deleted the entire sentence. Then went back up to the draft and finished typing my answer. A few minutes later, a sentence appeared in the space below. You did notice? Well, needless to say, I almost had a damn heart attack since I didn't expect to be right. And not too clever on his part since if he had just not responded... Who knows how long it would have taken me to prove it. I didn't panic. Instead, I engaged into idle chit-chat until I could figure out my next move. We corresponded for about a week or so before I was able to figure it out. I was victorious in the sense I no longer have a keylogger, but his identity and reasoning still remains a total mystery. Please call the toll-free number to turn yourself in now, peacefully, Mr. Keylogger. About a month after I had joined a group online, I had an issue with a stalker. It was around the month of February of 2018. 
and this was back when I was still new, not as popular as I am now. This guy, with an Arab-sounding name, had commented on one of my answers. It was a harmless comment, and being so naive and innocent to the online world of creeps, trolls, and stalkers, I commented back politely that I used to do. A few minutes later, the guy comments again, and so we had a little back-and-forth comment thread going on. It wasn't until he said two simple words that the alarms in my head start to quietly ring. Friend me. Confused, I had asked him what he meant, assuming it was a male looking at the screen name. He said he wanted me to friend him on Facebook, and when I told him politely and as nicely as possible that I didn't friend random people on any social media unless I knew them more, he became a different person. He started to spam comments and say information that he shouldn't have known about me, like the name of my school, the name of my family business, and where I lived. He had found my Facebook and could see this information about me on my page. This is when the alarms in my head started to blare loudly, and I immediately blocked him and reported him, while my heart raced in my chest. Scenarios of him finding me, kidnapping me, hurting me, were flashing in my head, and I was freaked out. At this time, I was friends with my ex. This was before we had started dating, and so I went to him, and he helped calm me down, and got a whole bunch of my friends and a hangout group to block and report him for harassment. After the guy found out I had blocked him, he purposefully made another account with the same name and started to spam comments again on that same answer. Thankfully, my settings were set so that only people who I follow can message me. So, he couldn't message me at all. I blocked him and reported that second account immediately. I then changed my Facebook settings so that no one can see my personal information, and I had deactivated my account for about a week. After that, I never heard or seen him again. I am now very careful who I follow back, who I interact with, and I also make sure I check out the profile before following. I do not want to go through all of that chaos again. It scared the hell out of me, and to this day, if I see a name like his, I tense up. So, I advise everyone to be careful with who you interact with. Yes, there are lots of extremely nice people. I have met so many amazing friends and people online, and just on the online world, period. But, there are always trolls and stalkers who want to scare you, mess with you, or, even worse, hurt you. The world is messed up with some messed up people. Be careful, that is all I say. And never reveal or show personal information unless you are absolutely sure you can trust that person. Because you could learn to regret it. In 2015, I met a guy who I will refer to as David. David was a good-looking boy, 16 years old like me, and we had a few friends in common. We began texting, and we became really good friends. We were a small group that would hang out all the time together. It was me, David, another girl, and two other boys. Soon, David asked me to hang out with him alone. I said yes, and we had a good time. Next weekend, he asked me again. I asked, why can't we just join the others? And he got kind of mad and said, because I want to be alone with you. That was creepy, but I didn't think too much of it. The upcoming days, he was acting a bit weird, asking me what I was doing all the time, asking me when we would hang out again, and he got mad when I would reply after more than five minutes. That weekend, I decided to join the others at a party without inviting him. 
He was there and asked me why I didn't tell him I was going, why I was avoiding him, and why I didn't text him back that night. I finally said, Look, David, we had fun and you're a good person, but we are not in a relationship and you were being too obsessed with me. So, please stop. Small point here. I never told him I liked him. We never kissed and I never made him think that there was an interest other than friendship. He then left without saying goodbye. At around two in the morning, he texted me, are you home yet? To which I did not reply. Five minutes later, I know you are home. I know Jason gave you a ride. That was fucking creepy. He was not at the party anymore. How could he know how and with who I got home? I replied, David, please stop texting me. And he actually did stop. For at least a day, though. On the next evening, he called me four or five times within a 10-minute time frame. I didn't pick the phone up. Instead, I texted Jason, asking him what was happening. I think Jason told him something because later, I got a text that said, Why did you talk to Jason? Why don't you talk to me? I finally said, David, listen, you are freaking me out right now. I ask you to stop once. This is the second and last time. Leave me alone. Minutes later, my mom called me and told me, get downstairs, there is a friend looking for you. Of course, it was him. I asked how in the world he got my address. He kept saying, please don't be mad. Don't hate me, please. I didn't hate him but he was really creepy at this point. So again, I told him to please stop or I would have to call the police on him. He left. For a few days, nothing happened. But one night I looked out of my window and he was there standing and facing me. He waved and told me to get downstairs. I was beyond angry. I went out the door and started screaming at him. He remained calm and kept telling me that he loved me and wanted to give me the best. I said, I am going to call the police, David. And he, C-A-L-M-L-Y, calmly said, If you do it, I will kill myself, Anthony. I was freaked out, to say the least. So, I went back inside and didn't call anyone. I blocked David on WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram, etc. The next day, I found a letter in my school locker. It was from him, telling me I had to be his girlfriend or he would shoot himself in the head right in front of me. I was desperate, so I went to the principal's office and told him everything, showing him the letter and some other messages. Since he threatened to commit suicide, we called the police and they took him away. He spent a few weeks in a mental hospital and then he moved. I have never seen him or heard from him ever since. I still feel scared when I look out the window at night. Yes. I have been stalked by a girl. She was in my class in engineering. She was a typical first bencher who always studied hard, spoke less, introvert, liked by all lectures and students. Everyone had a high regard of her. Whereas I was a last bencher, quite naughty in class, extrovert and friendly with people. Yet. I was very good at studies and very much focused about my goals in life. I had made up my mind to become an IAS, Indian Administrative Service, officer when I was at school and made constant efforts, like reading the Hindu newspaper daily, making notes of NCERT textbooks, studying prescribed books, etc. to achieve my goal right from class 10. 
Once in a class during our first year engineering, our lecturer asked each of us to tell about our goals. Since I was quite vocal and took pride in becoming a civil servant, I spoke at length about my goal of becoming an IAS officer. Unfortunately for me, she too had the same goal. I had never spoken to her in person. I just knew that she was a typical first bencher who studied well. In third year of my engineering, some of my friends and I started a club for science enthusiasts in college and were looking for members who were interested in joining the club. Then a mutual friend, who was a fellow founder of the club, spoke to me about getting her into this club. Without giving much thought about it, I agreed since she was good at studies. This led me to know her, though I had never noticed her much. Being in the same club gave a chance to interact and I got to know that she was an IAS aspirant too. I used to give her tips about how to study for the same. That was the limit of my interaction with her. I thought of her as a very dedicated student and a good friend. That's about it. Never did I try to go any extra mile with her. I had my own last benchers group with whom I used to hang out always, both guys and girls. Never told her or involved her with any of my personal stuff or things that would make her feel like I was interested in her, like chatting for long hours or going to the movies or typical dating stuff. My interaction with her was limited to discussion about our club, IAS things, and friendly conversation. It was our last day at college. She came near my room and gifted me an edited swap my face with movie stars who had played roles of an IAS officer in the movie. Photo frame. I thought it was a great gift, though badly edited, and thanked her for it and went back to my room and took my afternoon nap. When I woke up, I was in for some shock. I had received 60 plus WhatsApp messages. When I woke up, I was in for some shock. I had received 60 plus WhatsApp messages from her number. She had narrated how she had crushed on me from initial days of college and how her liking for me increased when she got to know about our common goals. Everything was described in intricate detail, anecdotes about various incidents. I thought it was great of her to remember things in detail, but I made it very clear that I have no such interest in her, and she was just a good friend. In fact, I thought of her more as a sister. She always gave me that sisterly vibes, like never bunking class, always sitting on the first bench, listening to the lecture intently. I did not tell her then that I thought of her as a sister, because I thought it would be rude on my part to say that to someone who had confessed her big crush. Moreover, I liked some other girl. I didn't think it was necessary for her to know that. I just had to convey that I was not interested in her, and I did. And then started the stalking days. Within a week after I completed my engineering, I had to join to my work in a different city. This made things worse. She used to ping me every now and then in WhatsApp, inquiring me about every single detail, like if I had my lunch or not. She told me that she doesn't feel like eating until and unless she knew that I had already eaten my food. Though it might look nice on the outset, I just felt it was very immature and started ignoring her texts. Is it only me or do others too feel suffocated when someone who you are not intimate with starts texting you so much? Her messages increased exponentially with every passing day. Though I told her very clearly I was not interested in her. She kept on messaging me saying that she too was doing that as a friend. But this insistent texting made me irritated. 
I had to concentrate both on my work and my dream of becoming an IAS officer. In addition to this, her constant pestering made me feel like it's a nuisance. Failing to make her understand that I don't like such constant messaging, I blocked her on WhatsApp, thinking that getting blocked will give her a clear signal of me not liking her and will make her stop messaging me. Meanwhile, I hadn't told any of my friends about her pestering me. I thought it would spoil her good girl image. But things took an ugly turn from there. She started obsessing over me and started emailing me on my email ID since I had her blocked on WhatsApp. Some people from her hostel, people whom I don't even know, also started emailing me about why I was doing this to her. Those mails used to be very lengthy, describing how I'm hurting her by ignoring her. I took pity and unblocked her on WhatsApp, but this time I made it very clear that I do not want to have any interest in her, but I always thought of her as a sister. Believe me, Indian guys don't just call a random girl as a sister. They do mean it. She agreed and started adding the suffix brother to every sentence in her text. This continued for a week, and then again things started being the same. She not only told me that she cannot think of me as her brother, but she also proposed to me for marriage and would send her father to my house to convince my parents to agree once I had achieved my goals. That's it, I thought. Things had gone way too far. I had to put an end to all of this. I told her sternly that things are taking a wrong turn here. I don't want you messaging me or disturbing me, and I want to be left alone. So I blocked her again. This did not stop her, though. This is where it started feeling like emotional ATR term emotional harassment. To me, she started calling me from different numbers and texting me from those numbers. Till now, I have blocked more than 20 different numbers of hers. She had also texted me from her parents' number, friends' number, and bought many SIM cards too. Some of her friends, whom I don't know personally, texted me that I was being very cruel to her and should unblock her and listen to her once. Once I unblock her, I used to get the same old, do you really not like me? I'll send my parents to your house to talk about marriage. No matter how much I told her that, I don't like. Things did not change. All of this was excruciatingly painful for me and emotionally. I thought I had enough of this and started informing some of our mutual friends about this. They initially denied it, telling that a good girl of her stature can never do such a thing. I had to show them the screenshots as proof. Only then did they start believing. They too started convincing her to leave me alone. But it was all in vain. I unblocked her several times again, convinced by her friends that she has moved on and would not stalk me anymore. But in the end, it would again come down to, do you really not like me? I had had enough of it. I would give her chances to reform her ways, then end up getting abused, how stone-hearted I am, how insensible I am, etc., etc. This constant mental abuse had a toll on me. Some of the effects were, number one, I started fearing girls, especially invert girls. One cannot say what are they thinking inside their mind, though I know all girls are not the same. I find it difficult to talk to a girl openly now. Number two, my study started deteriorating. I gave IAS prelims exam once and failed. I could not come to terms with it for a while. I had worked so hard for this from class 11. 
Number three, I was in acute depression, constant abusing my WhatsApp texts, calls, SMS, mails, and lobbying through mutual friends had made me depressed. Number four, with depression came insomnia. I found it hard to sleep at night. I was always thinking if all those things she had told me while abusing me, were they all true? There was a constant inner fight within myself. If what I was doing was right or not, should I give up resisting her and just accept which was opposing to my inner feelings? Number five, my self-confidence hit a great low. An IAS aspirant is supposed to be very confident, but in my case, things are taking exact opposite turns. I lost faith in myself. Number six, I started speaking to psychiatrists online through various apps, asking to help me with this emotional abuse. I was scared to go meet them directly because going to a psychiatrist is still a stigma in India. Number seven, when her abuse and harassment reached new levels, I even thought of going to the police to complain, along with some of our mutual friends with all the evidences. I researched online. A man cannot complain against a woman for stalking him. No section in Indian penal code makes this a crime, but vice versa is a punishable crime. This made me still helpless. Number eight, I started staying aloof. I no longer derived pleasure in doing things which I used to enjoy earlier. I started avoiding social gatherings. I started being an introvert. I kept in touch with only a certain bunch of close friends. Number nine, I started fearing calls from unknown numbers, thinking that it will be her calling for some unknown number just to irritate me. I still don't pick calls from unknown numbers if the name of the caller is not displayed in true caller. Number 10. Meanwhile, I had left my job after a year and three months to prepare for the IAS exam exclusively. My failure in first attempt had disappointed my parents and my brother. I had no courage to tell my parents about the incident. I feared that they would feel that their obedient son failed to achieve his dreams for some small problem caused by a stupid girl. Believe me, it was a not-so-small problem for me. Number 11. When I shared this entire story with some of my close friends, they started saying that I was lucky that a girl myself was stalking me, when the normalcy is for a guy to stalk a girl. They made fun of me. They all took it as a joke without realizing how disturbing it was for me mentally and emotionally. There were some positives that I can take from this entire episode, which lasted for more than two years. Number one, I started to have a great respect to girls who get stalked by guys. Now I know what they exactly go through. A little stalking might be okay with anyone, but when it reaches a level that one starts feeling abused, it is not okay at all. Number two, I always thought of me as not so emotional. The whole episode brought out a different side of me. I now know who exactly I am and what exactly I need to do and receive from this life. And more clearly, what or whom I don't need. Number three, since I had been a victim of depression for almost two years, I now can empathize with my friends and family who are suffering from depression. I make a special effort to talk to my friends who are going through depression. I support them, saying it's just like some other disease and one should go talk to a doctor. I make sure that they never, ever feel lonely. Number four, I realize that not all silent and decent looking girls are actually good. and. Not all outgoing and extroverted guys are bad. I don't judge people quickly now. Number five, 
Recently, I shared this whole episode with my brother, who asked me, what is the big deal with me and not picking up calls from unknown numbers? He was very supportive and told me that I did a good thing by sharing this episode to him and some of my friends. He told me that it's good that I kept some friends informed about these developments. Number six, there is a dire need for making some of Indian laws gender neutral. I have nothing against feminists or I'm not a misogynist. I only believe laws should protect everyone equally. When laws are gender neutral, only then can they bring harmony in society. I still get messages, even after blocking, SMS will be received, and I get a notification named message from blocked contact from her that she has moved on and that I should forgive her and should be normal to her again. I have forgiven her, but I don't think I'll make the same mistake of trusting her again and start being friends again. I just don't need it. I still get abusive messages that I am hurting and stuff. I just tell her to fuck off. Yes, I used it, which translates to get lost, only after two and a half years of her drama. And leave me alone. I really just do not care. I felt it was necessary for me to share this because stalking is not okay at all be it a girl or a guy or anyone in between who undergoes it. When crossed the limit, it has the capacity to disrupt your life. I request you all not to stalk anyone ever. I never felt like I was necessarily in danger, but it was a very unnerving experience, nonetheless. I met a guy through a dating app. We only exchanged a few messages before I decided I wasn't really feeling it. The conversation felt very unnatural and forced, so I stopped replying. A few months go by and I get a new match on the app. He looked kind of familiar, but I was still really new in town, so I knew the chances of me having met him already were slim. We talked for a few days, and then set up a date for that Friday night at a local Mexican place. We talked about our interests and told little stories about ourselves. I got a weird feeling because every once in a while, when I was telling him something about myself that I was sure I hadn't told him already, he was able to finish the story himself. It happened about three times during the course of the date. We were about halfway through our meal when he admitted that we had talked before, when he had a different hairstyle and used a different name on the dating app. I didn't believe him until he showed me the profile picture he had used with the old name. When I asked why he did that, he said it was because he was testing something. He said he had been told in the past that women like the nice guy, and so he thought he would give it a try when he first messaged me, but I blew him off. So instead of letting it go, he waited a few months, grew his hair out, made a new profile using a different approach just to talk to me. I get up from the table and leave the date. A few weeks go by, and the guy keeps messaging me and trying to apologize. I'll admit, I was avoiding healing from some stuff I had been going through and convinced myself that maybe he was worth getting to know if he had tried so hard just to get a date with me. I saw him a few more times after that, but it became really obvious that we just were not a good fit. He was awkward in an uncomfortable way. I always felt oddly tense around him, and even an hour with him felt like it drug on for days. Eventually, I stopped returning his messages. I received one to three messages a day from him between the dating app, text message, and Facebook for that first week. It tripled for the next three weeks after that. Then... Silence for about a month. I thought he'd finally gotten the picture. 
until one morning, I opened my apartment door to a letter laying on the ground in front of me. I had been out with friends the night before and didn't get home until around 1 a.m. The letter was not there when I came home. I left for work the next morning at 7 a.m. So that means this letter had to have been left on my doorstep sometime between 1 and 7 a.m. I was immediately creeped out. I live on the third floor of a locked apartment building. No one can come in the building without a key or a resident physically letting them in. I had no idea how someone could leave me a letter, but somehow he had found his way in the building and walked up three flights of stairs to my apartment in the early morning hours. The letter was mostly nonsense. He said things like, I can treat you like a queen, but you won't give me a chance. Or, I knew women didn't really like nice guys. You are no better than all the other whores. Typical toxic masculinity bullshit, but still, it scared me a little. I still had his number in my phone, so I texted him and told him to leave me alone and wanted to know how he had gotten into my building to begin with. I had already contemplated contacting my property manager to see if they would change the locks. He said someone had left the door propped open and he thought it was the universe telling him we were meant to be together. I told him that wasn't happening and I never wanted to see him on the property again or I would call the police. He promised to back off then but told me he still knew we would end up together. There was a few months of silence. I had gotten back together with my ex and everything was going great. I had all but forgotten the guy even existed. Until one day, as I was pulling out of the parking lot of my apartment complex, he rode by the entrance on his bike. I immediately froze. Last I knew, he lived on the other side of town and didn't have access to a vehicle. I went the whole day trying to shake off this weird feeling. Then, I received a message I had been dreading. He started off just saying, hi, but that was followed with a rapid succession of texts, each one angrier than the last. He kept yo-yoing between calling me names and swearing we would be together soon. I took screenshots of the messages, then blocked him on everything social media I knew he had. I sent the screenshots to my boyfriend and told him everything that had happened, just in case. The following week, almost every morning as I was leaving for work, I would see him riding by on his bicycle. Eventually, I learned that he had rented out an apartment in the same complex as me, just one street over. I started staying at my boyfriend's more, or having him stay with me. I put a notice on all my neighbor's doors asking them to not let any unknown men into the building for any reason. I even started carrying a taser, even though they technically aren't legal where I'm from. He hadn't done anything particularly terrible, and I consider myself lucky, given the kind of things a lot of other people have been through with stalkers, but just writing about it now still gives me chills. I'm not sure why he ever stopped, but after a few months or random ride-bys and anonymous late-night phone calls that I'm assuming were from his friend's phones, complete silence once again. It's been that way for about a year now. I'm moving into a new place with my boyfriend in a few months, so... I'm hoping that'll be the end of things entirely. Yes. Yes, I have been stalked. Just so when everyone knows, I'm a waitress. I work at a fairly busy restaurant, but it's seasonal. The summer was coming to an end, and there was this woman who I had noticed had been coming in more and more during the week. It started off normally with the small talk, 
and as she felt more comfortable, she started to share about herself. I waited on her mother for years before she passed away. She was a professor and a doctor, a very successful woman with a cool story. However, she never mentioned this daughter to me. She mentioned her other adopted daughter a few times, and I met her, but I never heard of her or met this daughter ever. Melanie was her name. She was a bubbly, over-exaggerated personality. Like, hey, your girl is here. Almost like she was the most important person I'd ever meet in my life. She said that she was from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the reason she was on the Cape was because her mother had passed and left her an apartment. But she wasn't sure she could leave Cambridge because she found Cape Cod to be so boring. And the most of the people were so undereducated and couldn't stimulate her intellect that had been fostered by her mother's love of fine arts and culture. I had this feeling Miss Melanie was a wingnut. She told the most fantastical stories, such as she had worked as a producer for Ted Turner, but she was taking some time off to get her health in check because she had MS and she needed chemotherapy for it, even though it wasn't cancer. I think she actually said that she was taking Interfreon, and from what I understand, that is a drug that's used to get rid of hepatitis. But she tried to tell me she has MS, and that's why the interferon. I had brought that fact up to her when she was going on about her mysterious ailment. She almost lost her mind. She gave me a very unsettled feeling, like she really overreacted to my comment. She had also befriended a local bakery that gave her day-old free goods. There was a cookie pie that I loved from there. One day I mentioned it, and every day after, she brought me one of those things. I didn't want to be rude. The first few times were nice, but after that, it was overkill. She started to hang around my work for hours at a time, talking all about herself being adopted, that her birth parents were doctors, but they gave her up for adoption because she had a heart problem. I thought the story was odd, but hey, it's her story. So she's at the restaurant all the time, sitting at the counter, telling customers to sit where they like, like she worked there, and ordered so much food for one person. She made it clear it was for her. She always went off the menu and have the cooks make her something she thought up. The cooks hated to see her come in. She'd always say, if it's not too much trouble, I thought explaining to her that the restaurant doesn't go off menu, but she still did the same thing. The other girls that worked there asked why I would allow her to come in and sit with me all day. I told them I felt bad, as she had just lost her mother. She's not from here, and she has health issues. It doesn't hurt to be kind. Well, that day I wasn't there, she showed up looking for me. One of the girls gave her my phone number. All of a sudden, I got a text from Mel. Hi, friend. It's me, Mel. When do you work again and gonna stop by? I've never had a customer text me, but okay. That night, she found me on Facebook by my phone number. She was in my direct messages. She had told me she went all through my Facebook. She was sorry my mom was so sick. She commented on my entire life. I was a tad unsettled, but not to the point I was going to make a huge deal over it. Looking back, I should have blocked her. At this time, I was very busy with my mom being sick, being her caretaker, that I would call into work sick. I was the boss after all. I work when I schedule myself. So, one of those days... Miss Melanie stopped by my job. The girls said she was pissed I wasn't there and that I didn't tell her I wasn't going to be. I thought they were kidding. Nope, they weren't. Now, I usually don't look at my phone all day. I lose it a lot, actually. It's not that big of a deal if I miss a message or a phone call. 
I found my phone later that day, and I have quite a few notifications, and they all are from Melanie. Where are you? I'm at your job. Why don't you tell me you were sick? I know you're on your phone. I can see in notifications. I see you are online. Answer me. And in between, she sent stupid gifs about being sad because she thought I was ignoring her. I thought to myself, this has crossed the line. I decided I was going to speak to her about boundaries and explain my private life is my private life and I'm a grown-ass woman who doesn't need permission to do a damn thing. Of course, the next day I'm there, she's got those damn pies. I think she knew I was upset. I explained to her, this is my job. And when I'm not there, I don't do anything that pertains to work. I don't run to my phone when a customer calls. It's actually inappropriate in the first place. I tried explaining. I'm not trying to be mean, but she's just a customer. We are not friends. We're people who have a place in common. That place being the restaurant, and that's it. I don't owe her any more of my time. To which she had not a thing to say. I thought she understood. Nope. She still texted me as well as direct messaged me on Facebook. Now she was friending my family on Facebook. She was going to my job when she knew I wasn't there to sit at the counter and tell people who asked where I was that she saw on Facebook I was with my mom. What in the fuck? The final straw that made me lose my shit. I had looked at my instant messenger, and it was Melanie, asking what hours I worked that day. I had told her I actually didn't know if I was going in or not. I might even leave early. That wasn't true. I was going in, but I didn't want her hanging out all day, talking about how life sucks and the injustices that she has endured. I needed to be on my game to deal with her. In all honesty, I did not want to see or talk to her. So, I had one of the best days at work, and I don't know how long. My relief waitress started to come in for the night shift. My first one that got there asked me if we could talk. She clearly felt uncomfortable. Of course, I told her yes, but was perplexed. I asked, hey, what's going on? She told me that Melanie had texted her, but didn't know how she got her number. Melanie had texted her to tell her to watch out. Shannon is trying to get out of work, if not leave early, so she can go do something else. She's trying to stick you with her work. How unprofessional. I can drive by there to see if she's there if you want. As soon as I read that text, I was livid. I told my waitress not to worry. I'd deal with this stalker. I sat on it for a day. I didn't want to be mean. I was a tad scared. What might she do if I upset her? Clearly, she had a motive to get my employee to see me in a different light, as well as undermine me being the boss. What the fuck is wrong with this chick? I had had it. Who does this? And did I mention she was 50 years old? A grown-ass woman acting like a little girl? I wrote her a message through Facebook. I told her that whatever her motive was, it was beyond inappropriate. I expressed that she was not one of the employees who needs to worry whether a shift needs to be covered. And furthermore, I needed her to find a new place to hang out. I didn't have the time, desire, or need for friends like her. I'd rather have enemies. The chick blocked me. Thank the Lord. She was really creeping me out anyway. She had injected herself right smack dab into my life. I was thankful she had just disappeared. After that, I started to look her up. Whoa. The shit I found. 
She said her sister was a loser who used everyone and that her kid was ignorant. I looked that sister up. She is a very successful in education. She was the director of a charter school in Florida. Hello. That sounds pretty motivated and getting on with life. Her sister had all kinds of awards to do with education. Then I found some of the places she had lived. They sure weren't Cambridge, Massachusetts. She lived in housing apartments. Hmm. Then she said she went to school and the end result was she became a producer, working for Ted Turner. This woman worked as a grip. Basically, she holds all the wires and cables so the person filming doesn't trip. She set up the lights. Not that it's not important as well, but big difference from producer. My husband had told me all along to be careful. She sounds a little off. I had brushed my husband off and told everyone to be nice, but this chick took it to another level. Haven't seen or heard from her in a few months, and I hope to keep it that way. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true stalker stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special thank you to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Samantha Place, Mrs. Innerscare, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Was Crispin, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Again, thank you all so much for being the pillar to support this channel. And all of the other subscribers and listeners, thank everybody for your continued support. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourself and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.